All right, moving into content area two, um, it's ancient Mediterranean, but we already talked about how there's going to be a lot of parts um, in this content area. And today we are starting part one, Mesopotamia. But even within part one, I'm going to break it down into the different um, cultures of Mesopotamia. And today we will be learning about the Sumerians. We already went through our enduring understandings for AP, um, but I went ahead and included this slide just so we can um, have a way to recall the information and the important things that AP wants you to be able to understand at the end of this content area. And let's go ahead and get into part one Mesopotamia. And like I said, this screencast will cover um, Sumerian art only. This is a um, handout that I am giving to you, so you'll be able to read it much better. Um, but I just wanted you to be aware that this is a very basic um, breakdown of some contextual information regarding some of the civilizations within the ancient Near East. And for our content area, we definitely cover um, the Sumerian art, um, we also um, cover the Assyrians, um, the Babylonians, right up here, and um, the Persians. So this little handout that I'll be giving to you will help you add some contextual information to those separate cultures. Here are some important facts on Mesopotamia. Um, first, be aware that, you know, we are um, leaving the term prehistory and entering history. And the one thing that is allowing us to make that significant change is writing. Um, so anything that is prior to, uh, you know, the development of writing is considered prehistory. Um, that doesn't mean BCE versus CE. So I really want you to make that distinction. Um, that has nothing to do with prehistory versus ancient history. Um, so the only reason we are um, now considered ancient history is because we have the development of writing. This is the tail end of the Neolithic period. So like I said, we're still in the fourth millennium BCE, and for this entire content area, we'll be going up to about six or 700 CE. Agriculture, 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 I cannot say it enough. It is what is responsible for civilizations to flourish, and agriculture is only possible in this region because of the Tigris and Euphrates River Valley. Um, these two rivers um, are what has made this area um, a place for lush settlement and also the development of how to irrigate from these two rivers is what has made civilization thrive. Um, you're going to see some really cool inventions during this ancient time period, such as a pictorial narrative cuneiform script, which is the first form of written word. Um, very important inventions such as the wheel, the ziggurat, which is um, a form of architecture that we'll be studying. Vast trading um, has really taken, um, taken off and people from you know, all over the area, uh, definitely equally participating in trade. And you'll also see um, the enhancement of very elaborate um, jewelry made from metals and precious stones. We are now getting ready to talk about one of the oldest and longest lasting civilizations. And if you refer to the um, to the timeline that I showed you in our presentation um, over this content area. And I tried to show you this entire content area from Mesopotamia all the way through Romans, how um, long the Mesopotamian 
um, era really is and how these different cultures actually overlap, that these civilizations were coexisting um, and it wasn't that, you know, one was starting and then it would end and then the second one started. It wasn't that, you know, the Mesopotamians um, ended and then the Egyptians picked up and then the Egyptians ended and the Greeks picked up. That, that's not, the, these were all cultures that were coexisting at the same time. Um, so that's a very important uh, way to look at this, um, especially when we're studying art and artifacts. Um, <clears throat> this was a huge advancement for um, urbanization and city development. Um, it, populations were growing. You know, remember, Neolithic times brought us, um, you know, put an end to nomadic kind of um, wandering and, and hunting and gathering and people in the Neolithic times, they were now settling and creating villages. Now we have those settled people who were creating villages um, populating and people are also migrating and moving. And so now you have these areas that are growing and innovation needs to happen in order to help life sustain during this population growth. So we're gonna to start to see urbanization and the construction of massive buildings. You're gonna see the development of city-states and um, we're gonna be able to look at Uruk, which was the first city ever made. And when I say city, I, you know, I, I definitely mean it in the truest sense. That is an organized, named um, civilization of people that, you know, belong to this area. And um, when I say city, I also mean it in kind of an urban sense um, that, um, you know, development happened in order to sustain the lives of you know, masses of people, okay? We're gonna see the start of government and not just, you know, government and politics, but rulers and what um, civilizations thought of their rulers and that they had a divine connection to their gods. And we're gonna talk a lot about religion. You're going to see um, different um, religious practices that worship um, different gods and goddesses, but um, you're going to see mainly a polytheistic type of worship. All right, so just focusing on the Sumerian art right now, um, these are the three images that we will be covering. So you have these images, and um, these are the ones you're going to want to pull out for your graphic notes. And I'm going to give you just a little um, two-minute video here about the Sumerians and some of their culture and what they're known for. I'm going to play this video during the screencast, hoping that it sounds decent for you. If it winds up um, being kind of echoey and hard to understand, then feel free to um, pause it and, um, you know, fast forward through that portion, remembering that I always post just the actual slideshow, and you can go back into the slideshow um, instead of the screencast and watch the video. It's very informative, and it's definitely worth the two and a half minutes. So let's give it a try.
All right. Hopefully you are able to make that out on your end. But like I said, if you cannot, please, please go into the slideshow and watch it on your own. It is full of great historical, sociological, and contextual information for the Sumerians. All right, so now we're going to get to our images, and we're going to start with image number 14. Um, the title is Statues of Votive Figures from the Square Temple at Eshnuna. So notice the term statues, okay? So we have um, the image that AP provides us with is this one right here. So it's a double image. But the point is that just like the Tlatilco figures, there were lots of these that have been uncovered. Um, so they were, you know, made in plentiful amounts. Um, so that's important to understand. It's not a, um, an isolated piece of art. Um, this is Sumerian from about 2700 BCE. It's gypsum inlaid with shell and black limestone. Those are all of the materials used to create these little statues. So in terms of content, what do we see? Well, in this image, we have a male and female figure. We have very large open eyes. They're spellbound as if they're witnessing a god. The men have long hair and rippled beards, which definitely shows kind of the styles and, and how um, the Sumerian men would wear their hair. We have clothing that is depicted. So we're able to see how both genders were to dress in those days. Um, men wore skirts and were bare chested. Women would wear a draped dress. Um, some figures would hold cups or branches. Um, the figures uh, represent mortals, so that means that they are representative of a human person. Um, <clears throat> and they are definitely um, standing in a posed kind of prayer form. Hands are folded together in a gesture of prayer and inscribed on the back, which you know we cannot see from this image, it, um, it says, it, that in cuneiform script it says it offers prayers is what it's kind of translated to. I think the function of these Voda figures are what's most important about them. Um, they were commissioned by more the elite or kind of you know middle uh, to middle upper class and what they are meant to serve is they are meant to stand in place of themselves uh, in front of the gods at all times. So for example, um, you know, we are, as humans, we have multiple things that we need to uh, accomplish within our daily task, but yet um, the Sumerians felt that it was very risky and very um, disrespectful to not um, kind of offer homage and offer prayer to the gods at all times. And so in their absence, they would have these little votive figures uh, stand in front of an altar that is, you know, basically ask, acting as a substitute for that person while that person is you know, tending to other daily tasks. So the function of these votive figures, I think, is honestly what's most important and why they are here. Um, it tells us that um, being committed to the gods and serving the gods and, and being present before the gods at all times was extremely important to the Sumerian people. So that kind of brings us into some contextual understanding. Um, so we know that these prayer figures were used as offerings, um, that they provide continual worship, and that it was important during these civilizations because, again, they, um, they felt it was important to be present before God 
um, in order to, you know, sustain their salvation. So even when they could not be present, they, you know, put a substitute in place. Um, hierarchies became practiced and are denoted in their artwork and visual representation, which is called hierarchy of scale. You are going to hear this vocabulary term a lot. Write it down, circle it, highlight it, put 50 million stars around it. Hierarchy of scale. We know that starting with um, ancient Sumerians, that um, importance of people, whether it be gender-based, whether it be mortal versus God-based, whether it be uh, civilian versus king or ruler, that hierarchy um, was determined by the scale or the proportion of the figures. So you are going to see that a lot. We're going to talk about that a lot. But this is one of your first notable um, examples of hierarchy of scale, which appears to be more gender based. Um, these were found buried in temple floors. There were hundreds and hundreds of groupings of them at the top of a ziggurat. Um, and <clears throat> this is a ziggurat is a, a type of temple, a place of worship. Um, it's another, you know, something comparable to like a church or an altar in a church. Um, gods and humans physically um, were present in the same space. This is what that represented. So again, as substitutes um, for the humans, um, this allowed you know mortals to be present and in and and um, physically present in the same space as their god. Right? It's very important to understand that um, nudity during these ancient times is a sign of debasement. Um, you will see within the artwork that only prisoners and slaves are symbolized and depicted nude because that was how they showed kind of, you know, shame and debasement to them. Um, and that this is not an example of that. This is an example of, um, you know, the type of actual clothing that was worn by Sumerians at this time that men were known for wearing. Um, high-waisted long skirts um, but would indeed have um, kind of a bare chest. Um, we believe that the votive figures are probably honoring their god Anu. So Anu or An um, is the divine personification of the sky which is the supreme god for the Sumerians and an ancestor of all the deities in ancient Mesopotamian religion. When we look at form, what we see here are still very stylized human figures. We absolutely positively know for a fact that these are people, these are human, but they're very kind of cartoonish, right? They're not naturalistic or realistic. So we still call them stylized. They are in a very basic cylindrical form. If you look at each one of these down here, you can tell their, their verticalness and the way that they're posed with their um, clothing that really overall, each one of them was kind of carved from a cylinder form. That the edges, the negative space, around the, the form, you know, was definitely removed from the same size cylinder. Okay. Um, these are carved in the round, absolutely, but they are definitely meant to be viewed from the front. So they are considered frontal. That doesn't mean there isn't a backside. It just means the backside serves no important information um, and that's really all about, you know, what you see from the front. Lots of expressions here. So we left Neolithic with um, an expressive artwork with the totilco figurines. 
and we're starting ancient Mesopotamian with some more expression on the faces. But these are all similar in the sense where they almost look like they're in a trance. You have these very wide eyes um, with you know, very large kind of pupil areas um, and their mouths are just kind of restfully and slightly open as, as if they are spellbound and staring in awe. And that is intentional, okay? You're gonna have um, some advancements here in textural details for the hair and for the clothing, you know, patterns of line. If you look at his beard and his hair, you have repetition of um, patterns of lines, both horizontal and vertical, even kind of like a chevron up here. Um, this is really showing us the textures of the waves that the men would have in their hair. Um, and then, the entire form um, is made from um, kind of a carved material, but the eyes are inlaid, okay? The white part is um, a shell. So if you, if you can imagine like the inner parts of a shell where it's very kind of shiny and iridescent, the underlayment of any sort of a shell, um, and then that's been kind of cut out and fused to the um, sculpture, both, you know, the white and the black. And so you have this beautiful inlay, this, this addition, this, you know, these shells that are set into these eye sockets. The innovations that we have for this sculpture is that we are starting to see the beginnings of negative space in sculptural forms. Negative space more so not around the outside, okay, because we've had that before. Tlatilco figurines do that. Ambum Stone did that. But if we go back a slide, we are starting to see negative space that occurs within the sculpture, in between the sculpture. So between the legs, between the folded arms, okay, within the armpits. That's the type of negative space I'm talking about. Not so much the negative space that occurs around the form, but through the form. So when we look at these um, figures, now that we're building up our library and our vocabulary, it is going to be so important for us to be able to make connections and take a moment to compare and contrast. When we look at these votive figures, what do you think um, you automatically compare it with? What, what does it remind you of? And not only do we want to compare, but sometimes we want to contrast as well. So, you know, what prehistory sculpture do you associate with the votive figures? And then on the opposite side, what prehistory artwork do you feel is very opposite um, of these votive figures? And it's important to be able to pull out both, compare and contrast. All right, our next image is image number 16 in your um, AP book. The title is The Standard of Ore from the Royal Tombs at Ore. This is about 2600 to 2400 BCE. Again, this is Sumerian. What we're looking at in terms of materials is a form created out of wood, but then inlaid with shells, lapis and red limestone okay and we'll talk more about that um, below i have included a photograph of the standard of ore that is on display at a museum because i really wanted you to understand the size relationship of this piece so um, it's not very big at all it's something that you can lift and you can carry um, and I think that 
also when you know the size of this and then we're able to look closely at it and notice a lot of the details about it, you have a much higher appreciation for the meticulous details that um, went into this artwork. So in terms of content, what are we looking at here? How are we observing? We have a two-sided form. Um, one of the sides represents the war side and the other side represents the peace side. Um, it could be two parts of a narrative and what we have here is our one of our earliest examples of a narrative. So we talked about narrative art, um, basically, you know, pictorial stories is what we're looking at. Um, art that tells some sort of um, chron chronology of story and it's read almost like you would read a book. Um, there's a way to follow it, you know, a lot like a comic strip. Um, there's a start and a finish and uh, a direction to how to read and understand it. Okay. Um, the war side shows the Sumerian king and he is in um, hierarchy because he is the tallest and he has descended from a chariot to inspect all of the captives that have been brought before him. Um, some of the captives are debased by their nakedness and chariots um, are just kind of rolling over and advancing over the dead. For the peace side, we have food um, that's kind of brought in a procession to a banquet um, and you just have all these like lovely, happy um, settings. You have musicians that are playing a lyre, um, the ruler is wearing a kilt made of, um, you know, beautiful tufts of wool. And again, the king is hierarchy of scale. You'll always see the ruler taller than anybody else depicted in the narrative. The figures stand on ground lines. So big vocabulary word, again, highlight it, circle it, put, you know, a thousand stars around it. We're going to be seeing and talking about ground lines. And that's how narratives were displayed, um, pictorial narratives. So the ground line is basically the ground, okay? The line that the figures are standing on is the ground line. Okay? And the way that this is read, it reads from the bottom to the top. Okay, so you would be starting at the bottom from um, right to left and then go up to the top, okay, and then up to the top. That's how it would be read. Contextually, what we have here is a piece that is a perfect, perfect example of a trading network because everything here is made with non-native materials. Um, the lapis um, comes from Afghanistan, the shells come from the Persian Gulf, and the red limestone comes from India. And it, it's even quite possible that the wood or the timber also had to come from somewhere else. Um, contextually, what this shows is the importance of kings and hierarchies in society. So you, we definitely have evidence of uh, classes and caste systems and that um, you know they're depicted pictorially through not just their size, but also, like I said, you know, showing the nakedness and the debasement of uh, people and enemies. Um, so it's 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 a real pictorial understanding of how people were grouped. This was found in a royal tomb. Okay, that's important to know, not just a tomb, but a royal tomb. And next to the tomb was a skeleton, a human skeleton of a standard bearer. So a standard bearer was um, somebody who was part of, you know, the king's court, whose job was basically to um, hold and carry a standard. Now, a standard is usually like a long pole, 
that would display something on it, like a, a banner or, you know, some sort of symbol that shows, you know, allegiance, right, to the ruler. And these standard bearers um, were fully dedicated, and they had no choice, but were fully dedicated to their rulers. And so because this piece was found laying next to a skeleton of a standard bearer, we know a couple of things. We know, number one, that it was probably a sacrificial death. So when the ruler passed on, a lot of his attendants um, also, you know, were sacrificed and laid to rest with, um, with the ruler because there was such strong belief in the afterlife. And I mean, such strong belief that, um, you know, most of the king's attendants uh, definitely wanted to accompany the king in the afterlife. There, there was no better honor than that. And um, being left behind, per se, was probably more fearful to them than um, being sacrificed and, and buried with them. So um, it's not that it was a negative thing to their culture. It was quite an honor. Um, so we know that there were sacrificial deaths, and we also believe that maybe the function of this box um, was displayed on a standard. And so perhaps um, a, a standard pole was attached to the bottom of this um, and was displayed um, by the standard bearer. So, you know, that's, that's what we're, we're believing. That's theoretically what we think the function of this narrative piece was. And please make sure that um, you understand that that's also the innovation of this piece, is that we have this, narr this very early uh, narrative style. So here are some great detail shots. So when I say inlaid, what I need you to understand is, is everything on here, um, it's kind of like a mosaic, okay, for lack of a better term. So none of this is paint, um, none of this is, is carved per se, but what it is, is is it's the blue is the lapis, the red is the red limestone, and then the creams and the whites are um, shell. And all of this was kind of, you know, um, cut and pieced and then adhered to the wooden structure. So that's what inlay um, for this piece means. So in terms of form, uh, we have figures that are in composite view. There's that word again, and I hope you remember it. I hope you remember it from Running Horned Woman because she was our introduction to composite view. And now you're going to hear the term composite view for quite a while. Um, Almost throughout this whole entire um, this whole entire content area, although we will see it develop and morph, but composite view is um, definitely prevalent during um, this ancient time period. You are going to see extreme hierarchy of scale of the people that are being depicted in the standard of or. Um, you're going to see exaggerated eyes and eyebrow features. And if you look closely, don't they just look like a two-dimensional representation of the votive figures? So what we're seeing here is a style, a Sumerian style of art, where you have these big, wide eyes, you know, with, with large pupils as if they're, you know, in a trance or some sort of you know, gaze. Um, we're going to see the the nose that just kind of blends straight into the forehead. Um, you're going to see the very exaggerated, um, thick, long eyebrow. So this is, you know, how we represent or how we're able to recognize styles of art. We see these similarities. Um, in terms of form, you know, we we talked that it's a hollow wooden box with a mosaic coating. 
um, we have a division of registers and the artwork is very detailed and very ornate. So let's talk about that, those registers. So we already talked about ground lines. So this line represents the ground line, okay, where the feet are standing, okay? Registers are when you have multiple, okay? So each row is considered a register, okay? So you have division of registers and it's detailed and ornate. Like I said, the function of this piece, first and foremost, it's a narrative, okay? It is, it was made to tell a story. It was made to record history, instill rules and morals and and enforce the power of the king's um, duality, okay? When I talk about the king's duality, what I'm talking about is his double role. So as king, he has been, you know, designed to um, lead the country um, politically, but also kind of religiously because they definitely believe that their rulers are descendants from God. So there is something that is divine about their rulers. They are divine rulers, um, that they are a kind of human or mortal form of a God, or they are descendants of a God, but there is some sort of connection relation to one, one or more of their gods and goddesses. So that is what I mean by a king's duality. And that's a lot of what this war and peace um, standard um, talks about, you know, the king's role um, in both of these worlds. We believe that um, it could have served as a possible royal emblem to the king, um, that we think it was displayed as a standard on a pole with a standard bearer holding it. Okay. Um, there are also theories that this was also a sound box for a musical instrument. Um, the theory about it being a, a standard that was on a, on a standard pole was because of how it was found, where it was found, the placement of it, um, you know, taking those clues. But when we look at and we compare it to other objects from the past, it could also have been a sound box for a musical instrument that just kind of allowed sound to be amplified, okay? Ultimately, at the end of the day, it's unknown, but those are the two main theories. Um, so, you know, again, we want to compare and contrast every piece. We already compared it to the votive figures because we're able to see um, the... Um, connections between their stylized ways of making the the human face but you know then it's like okay well how can we contrast it with something else do we contrast it to the totilco figurine um and the way that you know there this is in composite view do we compare it with running horned woman for composite view or do we contrast it with the apollo 2 stone which is, you know, strictly in profile view. Um, this is how I need you to be thinking and, and relating it to other works of art, um, because what we're doing is we're building upon, um, you know, ancient human advancement. And the more that you can make those connections from one artwork to another, um, the better you're going to be um, for the exam. Okay, so moving along, um, this is our next piece. It's image number 12 in your book. It is called White Temple and its Ziggurat. It's in the city of Uruk, which we talked about was the first um, city. 
um, which is modern day Iraq. It is Sumerian and we're looking at about 3,500 to 3,000 BCE. And the material it's made is mud brick. Okay. Um, the image that we get from AP is kind of the modern day image. So what you are looking at is remains, a relic, okay? You're looking at um, how it looks today. It's going to be important for us to be able to understand how it looked um, when it was constructed in its glory days. It's going to be important to um, be able to uh, recognize both, okay? Um, so in terms of function, why was this built? Well, it's pretty simple. It was a temple, and it was actually um, a ziggurat structure, and then on top of it was a temple. And that temple was dedicated to their god, Anu, who is the, the supreme god of the sky. Okay? The ziggurat, which was, you know, underneath the temple, was meant to resemble a mountain. That was strategic. That was on purpose. So here we are, you know, innovative and designing um, architectural structures with symbolic purpose. And it was meant to resemble a mountain so that the gods from above could descend from the heavens to a high place on earth. Okay. So it was meant to um, kind of be um, an, an easier place for the gods to um, come down when, when they come down to earth. This, this was kind of their, their place to do that at. There's an outer terrace, which the next slide, um, I'll be able to show you that better, that was used for ceremonies and rituals. And then there's the temple. You're going to see that a lot as well. You're going to see these kind of complexes that are built and they serve like multiple purposes. Um, half of it is, you know, a purpose to worship. So there's temples there and uh, places of worship. But then the other portion of it are these big kind of open civic spaces for gatherings or festivals or meetings or ceremonies. So it was kind of multi-purpose. In terms of content, there's not much to say. We have a ziggurat um, that will have a temple on top. Contextually, um, we know that the Sumerians really honored their gods and they honored them with extreme temples and dedications. Um, <clears throat> they dedicated so much of themselves to the gods. Um, this really was their driving force. The temple on top of the ziggurat was to allow them to be closer to their god and allow the gods to travel to earth. So instead of just constructing a temple, it was all about lifting that temple up and kind of creating a, you know, a faux mountain form <clears throat> that would allow people to be cl physically closer to their gods at, at times of worship. In terms of form, we have um, the four corners of the ziggurats are orientated to the compass. Now, this is very important. Like Stonehenge, we have to make note that these civilizations were not just plopping architectural structures and monuments down anywhere. It was very strategically placed and planned. And so the corners of the ziggurat are orientated to the four cardinal points. The interior of the temple contains what's called a cella and other smaller rooms. The cella, which we will use that vocabulary word throughout this entire content area, is usually where um, the deity resides, so the god or the goddess or a, a symbol of the god or the goddess, like a statue of some sorts, they are usually placed in the cella, which is inside of the temple itself. Since there is not a lot of stone in the area, and we, we talked about that in our introductory slideshow, um, a lot of these structures were were built with um, 
what's called mud brick. And basically, they would use kind of the, the mud um, that came from the nearby river valleys and form it into these, you know, large brick shapes and kind of work with them like you would large bricks. Um, and it, so it's basically a form of clay, for lack of a better term. Um, the difference is it's built in extreme colossal scale. Um, the other amazing thing about the ziggurat is that there are buttresses that are spaced across the surface to create, create light and shadowy patterns. And on the next slide, I'll be able to point those out to you. The mud brick itself is a pretty ugly color. And the Sumerians really wanted um, the ziggurat and the temple to, to glow, just to absolutely shine. And in order to do that, you're going to want it to be white so it reflects the light of the sun. And, and that reflection almost gives it a glow or like an aura. So once the um, structure was constructed, they would whitewash the exterior of it um, just by taking a um, kind of like a clay form, but a different type of clay that was white, that was naturally white, and <clears throat> water that down and mix it into like, you know, a, a paintable liquid, and they would whitewash the exterior. Um, it was used to purify and disguise that, you know, dirty mud appearance. Ziggurats were designed with innovation because they would taper down at the sides so that water would run off of the sides without deteriorating the actual mud brick. So if you think about it, we're looking at structures that are constructed with mud, with clay, okay? And they're baked in the sun and hardened, but nonetheless, they're mud. And in order to do that and not have the natural elements of rain um, decompose your structure, um, they designed the form of the ziggurat so that water would run off of the actual structure instead of settle and pool. If it was allowed to settle and pool anywhere, then that water would kind of deteriorate through the surface. So there's a lot of construction innovation happening within the ziggurat. So here is the page that is very important to understand its original design compared to the image um, of the ruins that you know were given from AP. So this is an image of the ziggurat. Okay, so this is the structure, and then on top of it, that's the temple. Okay, so the purpose of the ziggurat is just to give it this this lift off of the earth and to bring everything closer to the heavens. Okay? You can see that these little dark marks here, that, that's, those are to represent humans. So you can see the colossal size of everything. The stairs going up the ziggurat and ramping around and then coming to this large open terrace and then the temple on top. Okay. This is the temple on top, and inside the temple, so this was the exterior, inside the temple you do have some smaller rooms, but the innermost room is called the cella. And this is what the cella would have looked like, long and narrow, and all it is is an altar. It is where, you know, the divine or the deity sculpture would be located. This is what I wanted you to notice about kind of the, um, the purposeful um, innovation that we have here to wash rain away from the structure. So you can see it in this drawing, you can see it in this model, um, but these lines, these ditches that you see here, they're not just decorative. They are pretty much there to behave like gutters, like gutters off of your house. 
So not only does the slant of the ziggurat allow water, okay, at the top of the ziggurat to run off to the side and then down the angled wall, but then these gutter systems also carry water, collect and carry water away um, from the structure. So what you're seeing here is innovative construction. Okay, that ends our Sumerian screencast and um, we will continue on with Babylonians um, the next time we're together.